You're listening to the Right Stream Radio Network, rejoicing in the flow of creativity. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at RightStream and hashtag RightStream. Thanks for listening to the Right Stream Radio Network. Hi, everybody, and happy Tuesday, and welcome to Partners in Crime, and welcome to Right Stream Radio, and we're just going to get right into it today. We have a really exciting show, and we're going to be talking everything crime writing with the, my partner, award-winning author, Sue Coletta. Hi, Sue. Hi, Kim. I'm excited. How are you? Show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm great. How are you? Oh, good. We're going to have such fun, as we always do. And uh, how's the weather out there today? Today, it's a beautiful day, but um, it's cloudy, so, you know, New England can change on a dime. So far, so good. (laughs) I bet. (laughs) How is it where you are? It is, oh, sunny and beautiful. It's a perfect day. Yeah. Oh, so jealous. (laughs) Well, you have the beautiful scenery, though. <laughs> we do in the fall. We we definitely have the best fall. Oh, oh definitely. I, I'd rather be sitting <laughs> by a pool right now. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so I have this piece that I would love to start the show with, off with. It's beautiful. so inspirational, and it's a bit long, but it's so awesome. It's worth it. This piece, um, it's written by author James N. Frey, author of uh, How to Write a Damn Good Novel. He he has numerous craft books and thrillers, and he's a phenomenal author. Have you ever read his craft books? They're fantastic. I read How to Write a Damn Good Novel because my uncle actually sent that to me as a gift. Oh, well, there you go. And yeah, this it's a wonderful post, book. This post appeared um, in 2009 on my dear friend Larry Brooks's site, Story Fix. So I'm just oh. going to give their website real quick to give them proper credit. Perfect. Great. James N. Frey is www.jamesnfrey.com. And Larry's site is storyfix.com. Both wonderful wonderful sites. So Got here it. we go. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. It's entitled <clears throat> Who You Are and Who You Ain't. I have something I think is important to tell you about writing and the writing life, about who you and I really are and what our mission in life really is. Did you notice when you told your mother or father, sister, brother, or friend that you wanted to be a writer, the shocked, hurt, bewildered expression on their faces? Spouses, upon hearing the news, often get ill or take to the bottle. Some start packing. There are a lot of great quotes from famous writers on writing that tell of the struggle writers go through. Supposedly, Hemingway said that to be a writer, all you have to do is go into your room, sit in front of your typewriter, and stand, stare at a blank page until blood comes out of your forehead. We all know what it feels like to have blood trickling down our forehead, 
We all know there are days when the words will not flow from our brain to our fingertips, days when the most used key on the keyboard is the delete key, days when you think your mother was right, you should have taken the post office exam. We all know days when we say, what the hell am I doing bleeding from my forehead when I could be playing golf, fishing, or playing frisbee with my dog. Of course, writers don't play golf or go fishing or play frisbee with their dog. Few writers even have dogs. Who the hell is time for that? Writers don't go to a lot of movies or baseball games or picnics in the park. Writers don't do much of anything but write, think about writing, or talk about writing. We go into our little rooms, turn on our music, and turn on our machines and stare at the screen until blood comes out of our foreheads. That's the writing life. Not all that glamorous or glorious is it, taken a day at a time. And then after countless hours of agony, writing, rewriting, workshopping, editing, getting critiques, reading books on crafts, some of which are damn good, we try to get published and we find that bleeding from the forehead wasn't all that bad. Now we're getting banged on the forehead with rejection slips that hurt more than getting hit with a sledgehammer. Anybody ever tell you your work was not right for their list? What the hell does that even mean? They have too many critically acclaimed bestsellers on their list. How about they tell you it's beautifully written? They loved your characters. You obviously have a lot of talent and a great future, but gee, it's just not right for our list. We're not taking on any new clients at this time. Then why the hell did they say yes to your query letter? We try to find out what's wrong. So we go back to the book doctors and writers' workshops and hear that our work is boring or not right for the market, old-fashioned, too avant-garde, doesn't fit the genre, too derivative. <clears throat> and we go back to our room and bleed some rewrite out of our foreheads. <clears throat> These book doctors charge like hell. They, there goes the kids' braces. And so we try agents who charge reading fees to finance their trips to the French Riviera. And then the big day comes, and you finally get an agent who seems to really like your stuff. And after it makes the rounds to a couple dozen houses, you hear the editor loved it, but the pub board said it wasn't right for their list, that you write beautifully, they loved your characters, but your book, well, is not quite right for their list. At least your writer friends tell you you aren't still getting printed rejection slips made out to dear author. You have by now disabused yourself of the notion that there is an editor waiting in a book-lined office to shepherd your book through the process of getting you critical acclaim in your rightful place on the New York Times bestsellers list. It may happen someday, but in the meantime, you found out the first big truth of the writing game. The publishing industry treats writers like shit on their shoes. The price you pay for being a writer is high. Your personal life goes to hell. Your spouse and loved ones grow weary of being ignored, of having you care more for your characters and their travails than you do for your own family, friends, and their travails. You remember every holiday, right? Okay. You come to the table with blood on your forehead, but you give them several hours every damn year, so they should just shut up. Some years ago, there was an elaborate study of what makes for a successful writer. IQ? Hardly. Some of the best writers are not really all that bright. Education, Hemingway, Capote, Shakespeare, and a host of rich and famous authors had only a high school education or less. Talent? Apparently not. Hemingway said he had to rewrite each page 50 times. So what is it? What makes a great writer? It's the amount of blood that comes out of your forehead. The successful writers were writers who wrote and wrote and wrote. When Somerset Magam, at the time the biggest selling, best selling author in the world, was asked, Did he write on a schedule or when inspiration moved him? He said, When inspiration moved him. Luckily, he added, Inspiration moved him every morning when he sat down to write at 5 a.m. So we write and write and write and bleed and bleed and bleed. Then comes wealth and glory, right? Well, sort of. If you're lucky and you keep trying like hell, you get published. A sexy cover and everything. You think you've got it made. Think again. 
Now, thank God, you're published and you're not being ignored, but now you're being insulted by <laughs> critics, rejected by the public, sued, jailed, flogged, pillared, <laughs> hanged, <laughs> or burned at the stake. In fact, <laughs> writers are the most persecuted minority in the history of the world. There are countless <laughs> fiction writers, reporters, poets, bloggers, screenwriters being tortured at this very moment in China, Tibet, in the Muslim <laughs> world. And this was in 2009. This year, Iranian-American rock Sansbury was sentenced to six years in an Iranian hell where she'll likely be raped, sodomized, whipped, beaten, and starved. Her crime, she sought to tell the truth. That's what writers do. That's why we're prosecuted. Thank God we live in a country where all they do to writers is sue us, get us fired from faculty jobs, deny us tenure, ruin our reputation, and have us harassed by the IRS. (laughs) Every writer's motto is, writing is a bitch, and then you die. Now, you know why. (laughs) When When you told your mother you wanted to be a writer, she cried. You may find yourself asking why you ever wanted to be a writer. One theory is you're doing penance for the sins of your last life. Another theory is that you're clinically insane, schizoid, or bipolar. (laughs) Or maybe you just have some kind of complex. Most writers are alcoholic. Are you? Or maybe you've been called by God. In our heart of hearts, most of us think that's the case. Most writers I know are writers because they have an inner fire that will burn them up if they don't write. To be a writer is to live passionately. We live by our own inner fire. To be a writer, you must take a leap of faith. Writing is not a job, not a profession. Writing is a way of being. You live word by word, sentence by sentence, image by image, sitting in a darkened room, alone with your dreams and your fire, creating whole worlds. We sometimes get so wrapped up in the business side of our profession that we forget who we are. We forget our existential identity. You see, every writer has made a leap of faith. When we took the leap, we became someone else altogether. At some point in your life, you stopped saying, I'm going to be a writer, and started saying, I am a writer. The implications of this change are enormous. You have taken yourself out of the world of the everyday. You have landed on a strange new shore and have burned your boats. You now see life as your laboratory, and what counts is getting the book finished. As William Faulkner said, everything goes by the board. Honor, pride, decency to get the book. If a writer has to rob his mother, he will not hesitate. The ode on a Grecian urn is is worth any number of old ladies. Now you're in the dark woods of creativity, having given yourself over to the servitude of your own muse. Life itself is your subject, and your art is your only cause, and suddenly you feel yourself looking at the world through a lens that reveals the secrets of human beings and nature. You are becoming what the Greek gods, what the Greeks call a seer. The Navajo call a medicine man. The ancient Israelis call a prophet. Much of the ill treatment writers receive is because of fear that as a writer, you have a third eye, that you can see reality with more clarity but you can also see beneath the surface of everyday reality and into the nature of ultimate reality. And you know what? We can. People who don't live in the world of their own imagination, who live in the mundane world of everyday, fear this power. And the more you write and the longer you're at it, the more your own fears you, you trample and the more your third eye opens. People in ancient times understood the power of words. They were in awe of the power of words. The scribes of ancient Egypt were the priesthoods. They wielded both spiritual and temporal power. Think of it. Priests could see marks on a rock and change them into words. They could write on papyrus, and other scribes could read it, miles apart, even centuries later. Reading and writing to those who could not perform these feats were magic. Words come from breath as you speak, and breath means life. 
John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Words to ancient people had power. Witches and wizards cast spells with words. Hypnotists induce trances with word pictures. Priests bless with words. The God of Genesis called the universe into being with words. People fear us because we can bewitch them. We can take them out of their everyday reality and make them, even against their will, dream the fictive dream. Words sell products, create a demand in the market, marketplace, promote politicians. Fiction, my friend, is a teaching tool, teaching us about life. Romance novels teach us how to love. Mysteries teach us about justice. Adventure stories take us to new places, sci-fi to other worlds and other dimensions. It is by our stories that we truly live. Christ taught by parables. These parables are stories, and these simple parables brought an end to the organized cruelty that was the Roman Empire, by far the most powerful empire the world had ever seen. When Secretary of War Stanton met Harriet Beecher Stowe, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, at the end of the Civil War, he said, Ah, so here's the woman who started it all. And he meant it. Had there been no Uncle Tom's Cabin, there would not have been a civil war. The stories we've been told of the Dalai Lama have endeared us to him. This is a man who was kicked out of his country by the armies of neighboring of a neighboring country, whose supporters were murdered and tortured by the thousands. These are pretty much the facts of the case. We love the Dalai Lama, who has not called for war or revenge. He's a man who says his religion is kindness, and that's what he offers to the Chinese. It was mighty odd to us that the Dalai Lama's recent calls for autonomy sent thousands of Chinese students around the world, including those living in Paris and New York, protesting against the Dalai Lama. The West was shocked. How could these students be protesting a living saint? Ah, you see, the Chinese heard an a different Dalai Lama story. In 1963, the China, in China, there was a movie release called Surf that was a mega hit. The Tibetan serfs were shown as brutalized by the Lamas, who forced them into slavery and even burned boys alive as human sacrifices. In the film, the Chinese army liberated these oppressed people who were jubilant. How could the West Back such an evil man as the Dalai Lama. The power of stories is without limit. As writers, we create stories that show people how to live, how to act, how to feel. Stories teach what it means to love and self-sacrifice for others, how a hero should act and who he should love and embrace and who he should hate and kill. When we write stories, we are doing what writers have been doing for countless millennia, We are, a story at a time, creating morals and ethical systems and shaping culture. This is why the romantic poet Percy Shelley said that poets and creative writers were the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Joseph Campbell, the mythologist, was a great man, a great thinker, and an entertaining writer. He said it puzzled him for years why a man would jump into rushing river to save the life of a stranger. As much study and reflection, Campbell concluded that at that moment, the man realized that he and the man in the river were one, that all beings are connected, that we share a single creation. Sounds good, but I think in this case, the great Joseph Campbell had it wrong. At the moment of crisis, in the head of the ordinary man, the archetype of the hero put there by storytellers takes over, and an ordinary person becomes the hero and self-sacrifices as a hero should. Near where I live in California in the 1989 quake, the top level of two-story freeway collapsed, crushing hundreds of cars. This freeway ran through the hood, one of the most distressed, impoverished areas of Oakland, where dozens of young men hang out selling drugs, getting drunk, shooting up, smoking dope, cleaning their automatic weapons, temping whores, etc. This freeway collapsed 
right above them, and when it happened, without hesitation, they scrambled up on the freeway like air. The news people, seeing this through their helicopter-mounted cameras, described them as looters. But as usual, the TV people got it wrong. Nothing got looted, not a single wallet went missing. Cars were white suburbanites on their way home to watch the World Series that was starting that night. These young black males had instantly taken on the mantle of the hero and risked their lives on a teetering hunk of concrete. They saved many lives because they had surrendered to the archetype of the hero buried in their psyche, put there by storytellers. At Chernobyl in 86, young men who had been told all their lives there is no God, no afterlife, picked up pieces of metal and ran at the nuclear fire that threatened their country, even the world, knowing they would die a horrible death soon after these actions from radiation sickness. These men had surrendered to the archetype of the hero buried in their psyches, put there by writers. The pen, it said, is mightier than the sword. A sword? Hell, it's more powerful than an atomic bomb. No wonder writers are feared. If instead of becoming a writer, you would join the Harry Krishners, say, your family might be shocked, the bald head, the orange robes. But by becoming a writer, not only have you joined another faith, you're a member of the priesthood. By mastering your craft, by bleeding through the forehead, you are gaining a sort of supernatural power, the power to create stories that cause people to enter into a kind of trance, to be in the story world you have created to think and feel things that never would have they never would have thought or felt in their ordinary life you are creating stories that tell people how to live and how to believe you can actually bring change to the world you can give voice to the voiceless hope to the hopeless kind of power are scary it's no wonder your husband now has a girlfriend named daisy or your wife a boyfriend named rock they (laughs) <laughs> this, they say, is the information age. It is the writers, my brothers and sisters, who mold the information, who amplify it, who manipulate it, who form it into stories. No matter your success in the commercial aspects of your craft, you are repaid for your agony. All the blood coming out of your forehead is worth it because you can experience what all creative people, writers, artists, musicians, experience, the ecstasy of being a co-creator of this world. So that, my fellow believers, is what your mission is and who you really are. James N. Frey. Wow. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Uh, I think, you know, especially for someone who's just wide-eyed and ready to jump into being a writer, you know, the first half, they probably <laughs> run for the hills. <laughs> right? Right? But that, but, but, that, uh, but, but that, it's all uh, true, right? It's so, that that's, I, I just can't believe it, just listening to that. It, it, it was just a masterpiece. It, wow. Really, yeah. He's amazing anyways, but, you know, and I think for for new writers starting out, it's important for them to hear all the the crap we have to go through at the beginning because at least they can hang on to it'll be worth it in the end. Right. If they don't have have that burn, then they, they shouldn't be a writer. Absolutely true. And I think, you know, part of that, though, is they're going to have to experience it in that beginning because I think new writers are so in love with their own work. It's kind Mm. of like a normal phenomenon. So when someone tells you that first time, hey, yeah, this isn't really going to work or you're going to have to rewrite the whole thing and it's almost shock. I I think it's like that five stages of mourning. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Oh, true. <laughs> right. Oh, true. You know, because and you really it's, have to go just, through that. Yeah, you really do. No one can really prepare you for that initial shock of, but I thought I was the best writer in the world. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> it's true. 
and and, and there's nothing really wrong with <clears throat> having a little pity party for yourself as long as you uh, you know take take half an hour and then get back up and keep going right and i think you really you know in a lot of what you read is kind of one thing that kept coming back to me is that real need for tenacity because i think it would be maybe similar to trying to go to hollywood to be an actress um, yeah, that, that you really can't you can't give up, and you have to keep p- picking yourself up, and but at the same time not lie to yourself <laughs> and right. think that you're you know this amazing perfect writer in the beginning that you have to go through all those aches and pains and rejections and all of those things that are painful to go through, but yet you just got to keep keep getting back up, keep getting back up. And and right, 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 right. Yes. Keep keep writing. Right. Because eventually you'll get there somehow. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I thought it was the perfect um, way to start a show about writing. Boy, it really is. And I mean that, wow. I mean, it, it just really was very moving. You know, it was really a very was. moving piece. And it kind of reminds me of, you know, back in the day before we were born when people would sit around a radio, you know, and and actually listen because there weren't, you know, before there was television. And Mm -hmm. that's kind of the the impression that I got listening to you reading that was kind of there's such a, a different experience with radio than there is with TV. And your mind kind of wanders and you get all this imagery in your head and you really get to use your imagination more so, you know, and especially the way that you read it. And it was really, really just beautiful. I read, I read it early this morning. And as soon as I read it, I was, I said, wow, I, everybody needs to hear this because, because it is so inspirational. After it really the is. Initial, <laughs> the initial, initial <laughs> truth. So um, right, that absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Once you get over that first half of, oh boy, maybe I should take yeah. another <laughs> another <doesn't>, life here. <laughs> it doesn't it just get you all fired up. Like as soon as I read it, I'm like, oh my god, I have to write. It just immediately yes, gives you yes. that. Oh, he knows how to absolutely. touch our inner fire. I guess <laughs> it really is. It really it's so inspiring and. You know, it it just makes you want to move mountains after you hear it, you know, because it just, you know, (laughs) everything was so true. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we take a quick break and we'll come back and we'll just jump right back into that first new phase of becoming a new writer. Okie doke. Okay, we'll be right back. Are you a busy entrepreneur who wants to enhance or expand your influence but don't know where to begin? Then be sure to tune in to The Right Stream with Daria Ann every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern on Right Stream Radio. As co-founder of Right Stream Publishing and Right Stream Radio Network, Daria and her expert guests share valuable tips to help you write, publish, and succeed every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern on The Right Stream with Daria Ann right here on Right Stream Radio. Well, welcome back, everybody, to Partners in Crime. And uh, my partner, Sue Coletta, just got done reading a masterpiece by James Frey uh, about what it really is to be an author and a writer. And, Sue, what what would you say if you just had somebody call you up and say, hey, Sue, I decided I want to write, what what would be the first piece of advice you would give to them? <clears throat> Besides run <laughs> and pick something up. <laughs> Um, right. <laughs> usually my first advice, and I wish somebody told me this when I first started because it would have saved me years, was a study story structure. Because story structure is really the magic bullet of storytelling. If you look at every, you know, blockbuster novel out there, they all have the same structure. 
all movies, all TVs, shows, that everything has the same exact structure. And if we learn to structure our novels this way, then we're all that much more ahead of the game. Right. So could you tell our listeners just kind of a brief idea of what a good structure would be? Okay. A good structure is we need to start off with a hook. And the you know, that drop drop your reader in the middle of something. You know, you don't want to start off with a long backstory because uh, until the, the reader gets to know your protagonist, I don't care. So drop them in a situation where they can gain empathy. And that's really the key word. They don't have to, the reader doesn't have to like your character, but they do have to empathize with them in order to go along for the ride. So that's your hook. An optional milestone after the hook is an inciting incident. Now, that can happen between the the hook and the first plot point, which is at 20 to 25% of the way into your novel. And usually the inciting incident is, you know, something happens to to kick off the quest. Suppose a, um, if you're writing, if you're crime writing, a lot of times it'll be a body gets discovered. So, but you can also use that for your hook. That's why they say it's optional because I like to include two, but you don't have to. The first plot point is the most important moment of your story because that really starts the protagonist on their quest, which is, you know, the 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 plot of your story. So something has to happen to force them to act, and that happens at the first plot point. And the ideal location for that is 20 to 25% into your novel. Then at 37, roughly, percent, we have the first pinch point, and that is the first peak of the antagonist force. Now, we say antagonist force because it doesn't have to be a person. Um, It can be a weather like man versus tornado or whatever. But in crime writing, it's often a killer. So that's the first peek at them. Then, And could you give us an example of what that pinch point would be? So your killer comes in, is that him actually killing someone? Would that be an example? Well, it, it can be. You can use a cutaway scene. Um, if you alternate point of views, it can it can be a scene where he's stalking the protagonist or another victim. He could be murdering somebody. Or if your book is only in one narrative, just the through the protagonist's view, then maybe he makes contact with the protagonist or there's some sort of peak. You don't have to show him in all his glory yet, but there's got to be a peak there. Okay, so when you say pinch point, you're really referring to something that almost kind of highlights the antagonist, sort of? Yes, yes. It's, it's, It's the first look at what is standing in the way of the protagonist from reaching their goal. And the goal was set at the first plot point. So whatever happened on the, at the first plot point that made them have to act, the pinch point is where you're showing the big obstacle in their way of achieving their goal. Okay. So once you have your, you know, you have your protagonist, you have your antagonist, and once you kind of you set that obstacle for the protagonist, and then about a third way into the book, you want to see that big obstacle in their way. Exactly. Exactly. Very interesting. Okay, and then, and then, then the what way do you go? What's that? Yeah, I was going to say, then where do you go from there? 
Okay, yeah. The the midpoint, which is exactly halfway, usually the story will shift, which is why some craft books call it midpoint shift. Um, the story takes a different direction. So if the the protagonist, let's say the protagonist um, is a detective chasing a killer. So at the first pinch point, you know, we see something, suppose there's another, you know, there's a really bloody murder, or this time he left a note in blood on the floor. So then at the midpoint, something needs to happen, like the detective deciphers that cryptic clue, and oh my God, it has to do with him. You know, it has to, the story has to change in some way to send the protagonist in a new direction. Okay, so, and could it almost be viewed, yeah, could it almost be viewed as like there's little hope that the detective might solve the case? It could if it leads him in a different direction. But usually, basically, there's a change. It's some sort of change. So, if they were going in a straight line all the way to the midpoint, they just banged a hard right at the midpoint. Ah, okay. Gotcha. So it almost kind of takes the reader to, oh, I almost wasn't expecting that to happen. Exactly. Exactly. Gotcha. Okay. And then the fascinating point comes next. And that's at 65%. And... This time, an entire scene has to be devoted to the antagonist. So I usually show the killer actually murdering this. Um, and we really want to see him in all his glory. You know, we really want to see just how evil he really is and how big an obstacle he is opposed to our protagonist. And we do that at the second pinch point. We can do okay. we can do these things in between. I often write my um, I have one series where I alternate between the antagonist and the protagonist, and that's the thing. As long as you make sure to facilitate those stories along the way. Gotcha. That's very interesting. So you've got your first pinch point, your second pinch point, and then you go to your midpoint. Is that right? You've got your um, hook, your first plot point, your first pinch point, then your midpoint, then your second pinch point, and then at 75% into your novel, you have your second plot point. And it's at this point where you must release the last Um, because you have to give your reader a, a shot at figuring it out. So you, you don't, the protagonist doesn't necessarily need to understand the information, but if someone were, were to go back and read your books, all the clues would have had to have been there, however subtle you snuck them in. Ah, gotcha. So three-fourths of the way through, there should be enough information for the reader to either solve it or go back and and be like, oh, I missed that. Exactly. Interesting. And that's your second plot point. And then you have your um, climax, which is the battle between the protagonist and the antagonist. And it's important in the climax that the protagonist either defeats the antagonist or martyrs themselves. I mean, even though it's not a fair option for most readers, um, but they have to do it. So if, if, if you were the protagonist in my story and we chased down a killer, I couldn't... You know, shoot him, with, and then, you know, you just stand there. You have to do it because you're... Okay. 
because we've sat, and the reason for that is from the very first page, we have taken the time for our reader to to empathize with our character, and and they start rooting. So if somebody else defeats the antagonist, it's kind of a look at them. So... Whatever. So, so in some way, the protagonist has to defeat the antagonist in that situation. It can't be an outsider. Did I lose you? All right, we're going to go ahead and take another break, um, just due to a little technical difficulty, and we'll be right back. Are you looking for an entertaining, informative, and newsworthy show? Well, look no further. My name is Donna Lyons, and I'm the host of Love, Liberty, and Lip Gloss, which airs every Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern on the Right Stream Radio Network. This lifestyle show covers just about every topic you can think of. I interview some of Hollywood's biggest stars, professional athletes, politicians, entrepreneurs, musicians, comedians, fashion designers, health experts, best-selling authors, artists, psychic mediums, and the list goes on. You don't want to miss the surprises, the entertainment, and the wealth of information this show offers. And remember, this show just may be the simple equation that can help you discover your true passion. So come on, join me and listen to Love, Liberty, and Lip Gloss every Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern right here on the Right Stream Radio Network. Welcome back, everybody, and we're talking to Sue Coletta and about crime structure in your story. Are you there, Sue? Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Living oh, on a okay. mountain. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I missed and I your think question. because yeah, I think some of some of that cut out. So could we go back to what you were saying about the protagonist? Um, I think you, what you were saying was the protagonist really has to be the one to defeat the antagonist. Is that what you were saying? Yes, yes. It, it, because you know, it's it's the the reader roots for him, and so you know they want that satisfaction of seeing um, their hero defeat the antagonist. So that really should happen at at the climax, and then. In the resolution, we show, which is at the end of the book, we show the protagonists in their new world after they've completed the quest, um, usually better because of it. And we can get into that with the character arc structure. But that, you know, so in the in the resolution, you end the book with showing them, you know, they've just gone through hell, but they made it, and here they are. Now, you don't have to end, you know, on a high note. So, some people like to, but I, I like to leave that one lingering question of danger in my books, but it's really a personal choice. Now, could that be that you leave that lingering to set up for a sequel? I do. Yes. Yes. Okay. But you don't have okay. to. I, so, you know. Okay. So I guess it, it really depends on what your goal is. If if it's just a one, you know, sit-alone type book that's going to stand by itself, then you might want to have, like, a full, complete closure for your reader. Yes. You could, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, but, you know, le- there even, was... even leaving a question that makes them think is fine, too, without spelling everything out. That's fine, too. Okay. So just in case, because we had a little bit of break up there, could you just really quick go back to the beginning and just describe it one more time, particularly with the pinch, the difference between the pinch point and the plot point? Sure. Um so it's hook, and that's at the beginning. And the best advice I can give is uh, start late, end early. 
and, and really what that means is you don't have your character waking up and hitting the alarm button. You know, that's way too early to start. Have them frustrated because their garbage disposal just ate a spoon or, you know, something like that. Start them further along where their life is disrupt, disrupted over something. So that's your hook. Then your first block point at 20 to 25% is the most important moment of your story, that quest, and forces your protagonist to act. The pinch point is at 37.5%, and that is the first look, our peak at the antagonist force that's trying to, um, the obstacle standing in their way from their completing their goal of this quest. Then the midpoint shift, something happens that makes the story take a turn in a different direction. And that, of course, is at 50%. And at 62.5 is your second pinch point. And this is a full peak at your antagonist force, and showing just how truly evil they are. And then the second plot point is the last chance to inject information to help your protagonist solve the crime or or you know depending on your novel if it's a, if it's a mystery then it's the last point you have to have your um detective solve solve the case but they don't have to understand what the clues mean, but they have to be present. And then your climax, that's, you know, towards the end. There's no really set percentage. Um, That's the battle between the protagonist and the antagonist, and that's where the protagonist defeats the antagonist or um, martyrs themselves, which has been done successfully. Um, and then the resolution where you see the protagonists in their new world. Um, and, and, that, and it's, you know, that's it. Unbelievable that my phone is ringing when I shut off the ringer. And it, <laughs> can you guys hear that? I hope you can't. Did I lose you again? Did I lose you? You've got to be kidding me. Hello? Oh, I'm here. I'm here. Oh. Yes, I'm here. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I was just about to stop swearing on the glass. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I said it must be a call from the other side. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, oh. Quickly, we can... Um, we can go through the character arc structure, which is important. And yes, really, absolutely. The the way I like to do it is a four part um, structure. So each each part is twenty five percent. So there's four quarters to your novel. The first quarter, your protagonist. In the first quarter, you'll introduce your characters. Um, You might foreshadow future events. You gain empathy for them. And you also set up your first plot point. So a lot of times the first plot point, uh, yeah, okay, first plot point will strike at the protagonist's uh, character flaw. Because, you know, that's... That's a great way to force them to act. So then the second, oh, and and during this act one, the protagonists, they might make a little headway, but it's like one step forward, two step back. You know, they're they're trying, failing uh, over and over and over. 
Then the second quarter is the response quarter. And they 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 reel, they fail, they resist, they fail. That they they did all that through the, the first quarter. Now this second quarter is when they're they're reacting. So they might make a little more headway, but they're still not really you know, they're not overcoming their inner flaw. They're not doing enough and they just can't understand why because they're really trying, but they haven't grown yet as characters. So then the third okay. quarter, third quarter, they start attacking. And here's where the true character emerges and they become a warrior. Now it's screw you, buddy, you know, I'm, I, I'm on you and I am not letting go. So that's the third quarter. And the fourth quarter is, of course, they're, you know, they've, they've learned to overcome their fatal flaw and, you know, act accordingly. With a series, it's a little harder, though, because with a series, you can't have them do a huge, make a huge character arc every single book. Right. Yeah, it's got to be right. more subtle. Right. Um, now, so if, if you're working on a series, let's say your character has um, a flaw, like a fear of flying or something like that. Right. Um, then in in your second book in that series, would you change it to a different flaw, like altogether, so you'd introduce a new one? That is an excellent way to do it, yes. It's a fabulous way okay. to do it. So that each book, they're overcoming, you know, another flaw. But take right. um, Shawnee Daniels from Wings of Mayhem. She is snarky and full of pride, almost grandiose. I mean, she's just really, she thinks she is just the cat's meow. If <laughs> I, you know, if I had beaten her down to the point of making her realize she's not as good as she thinks she is in the first book, I'd have nowhere to go. So I right. had to take little flaws that she had, like lying. You know, she, she lies. So, so, she, so she might, in the first book, she might get burned by a lie she told or something like that. Right, right. right. You know, right. The, 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 right. And the nice part about things like being a habitual liar or um, untrusting of others is even though they overcome it in one book, they can certainly fall back into that trap. We all do in real life. So. Right. Almost like a relapse, if you will. So they can relapse maybe in the second book with a problem they had in the first. Exactly. Yep. Yep. The the sky's the limits, really. I mean, I, I, I like, if you think about it in terms of the three dimension of characters, it, it it's really becomes so much easier to pick, you know, for a series, which flaws to do. And the three dimensions are we all show a public image to the world. That's your first. Your second is person, your fr- your close friends and family now. And the, <clears throat> the third dimension is if you're in a trapped in a building that's on fire, would you bolt to the exit and elbow your way past a million people or would you stop and try to save as many people as you can on your way out so if if you think of characters in that way then it's easy to pick you know we your hero doesn't always have to be the guy that will drag him out of a burning building but he can certainly have that in him Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Or he, your character could run down the little old ladies to get to the exit. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely can. 
Although if you do write that, I suggest you make them feel horrible about it after the fact. <laughs> right. Or your reader will be like, oh, screw this guy. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that that's that's it in a nutshell. That that really makes a lot of sense how how you broke that down and I know a lot of people have trouble with this. Um, how do you name your characters? What do you have a like a certain guideline or a rule you use, or do you look at the phone book? I mean, how how do you go about that? I love naming my characters. I, I think it's one of the funnest things to do. What I do is I usually pick, well for my protagonists. I'm pretty open. Um, I try to fit their personality to the name. That could be ethnicity. That could be their job, you know, any aspect of their life. And apparently I have a habit of overusing the the, um, S's, apparently. Oh, (laughs) yeah. Okay. Yeah. And but, and do you always I, – I remember you saying something last time. You do start them always with a consonant, though, don't you, like a hard consonant? Uh, my my antagonist, yes. I like my antagonist okay. to have and, a hard consonant, and I like their name to match the theme of the book. Okay. So could you give us an example? Um, Not without <laughs> – Ruining one of my. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right, right. How about making it up though? Like, let's say our, our story is about a strangler. Um, would okay. you incorporate him being a strangler with his name? Um, I might, but really more the I would go after more the theme of why he killed and fit that to his name. So that his name almost becomes a hint all in itself. Ah, okay, okay. So maybe if his his motive for murdering started with some, I don't know, deep childhood thing, you might tie it in there somehow? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Can, like, can given, you explain uh, that? Like give a you know oh, give him the name of of like a a bully in school like who would the bully be? Oh, like Butch maybe. Yeah, someone like that. Yeah, someone like that. Okay, and it's usually and very why, subtle too. And and you do you pick the hard sounds because you you don't want him to be a softy in other words, right? You want him to, you kind of want that name to encompass that fear. Or even by the sound of it being kind of harsher, because you don't, um, you know, you don't want him to be a, a, a weak character. Basically, is that is that the thinking? Exactly, exactly. And gotcha. that's, you know, that's my personal preference. There's no right or wrong. But I, right. I just, you know, it sounds better than you know, uh, Butch grabs for the weapon in his handle sound uh, in his holster sounds a lot better than. Um, you know, Sammy <laughs> or, let's see, or it's Ernie. Not bad. <laughs> you Ernie. Want, yeah. So you wouldn't want to name your killer Ernie. <laughs> right. Ernie grabs a gun from his holster. I mean, that just doesn't have the same punch, you know? Right. <laughs> As Butch, you know? <laughs> right, right. That makes that makes perfect sense. Now, on yeah. the other side of that equation, do you give your protagonist softer names or how how do you approach that um well sage from mard i actually gave her that name because she's she's earthy and she's spiritual and i thought sage kind of encompassed her personality that way right so so you've really got a little bit of you know somewhat meaning behind the name a little bit yeah, yeah. I, I it takes me a long time to name my oh my goodness. Can right. any other bells or whistles go off today? I mean this is great. <laughs> <laughs> right, I love it. It always happens at the perfect time. <laughs> I know. But yeah, I, I well can I, you I like to do that. 
Well, can you tell our listeners a little bit about point of view? Because this is a kind of one of the more it can be tricky when um, you're you're talking about. So could you kind of explain what point of view is and how you should use that in writing your novel? Oh sure, point of view, and it is. You're right. It, it's 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 usually one of the hardest things to master when you're first starting out because you don't really grasp it. And what really changed it for me was um, if you picture a camera and your protagonist is holding a, a camera, whatever the protagonist sees within that camera lens, you can write. The protagonist can hear his or her own thoughts. Obviously, they can't hear anybody else's thoughts. And they can't see something that's not within their camera lens. So if the, your protagonist is standing in the living room and the cat is tearing up the carpet in the bedroom upstairs where another character is, you can't mention that because your char- character, they can hear it. So they could say, you know, Fluffy was digging, scratching on the on the carpet, but you're going to have to say it in a way that your your character hears them scratching, not sees them scratching, which is also a smart thing to do to help invoke the five senses. So I don't Would know. Did I help her? Thing? It does. Would it be a basic principle that only your main character or protagonist can use the word I? Yes. No, well, Would that no. Be Some people... In other use, words, like... You, if you write... So it depends. Okay, let... <laughs> and that, that word is so <laughs> often, isn't it? Um, if you... Right, right. My, Michael Conley writes... Um, in first person, which is I, he writes his protagonist and his antagonist in first person. So, okay, by alternating so but chapters. Would, so it, but right. So you would alternate the killer. So the reader would somehow know who was speaking by some setup in the beginning that it was the killer or the antagonist versus the protagonist. Exactly. And you really need to okay. ground them into whose head they're in in the very first sentence of the new scene. Right. And so would know, it be we, safe to say that other than those two characters, none of the other minor characters should be saying, I did this or I did that? They really shouldn't. I mean, you know, I'm not saying you, you can't give it a try because... <laughs> Some of the best books are experimental, but it right. let's, for argument's sake, let's just you're writing in first person, limit it to your protagonist, because we're not Michael Conley, <laughs> right? And <laughs> you know, limit it to that. If you want to switch to your antagonist in alternating chapters, then cue the reader in the first sentence by saying. Uh, you know, back in it, back in my lair, or something. You know, right, so. because really, it would be almost impossible to tell a whole story just from the protagonist's position. Like, if your detective goes into a coma, for example, or gets injured, there would have to be other scenes taking place, right? Yeah, yeah, it's difficult. There, are, there are books, of course, where it's told just by um that one detective. Matter of fact, a girlfriend of mine was just telling me about this book and of course the title escapes me. But the the <laughs> detective got in it's a historical crime novel, so he got uh run over by horses and the buggy and Ooh. lost his memory. So trying to remember the case he was working on because apparently Everybody wants him dead because of this. So it really, 
the author had to be very, very talented to pull it off. Because, you that know, you're... That sounds tough. Tell the story. And the, the guy doesn't even remember his own name. I mean, the amnesia is really bad. So, yeah. Ooh, yeah, that, that, yeah, that sounds like a challenge. <laughs> right? It really does. Right. But now, you can personally. do... Right, but you can do points of view of other characters, but it's just done in a different person, correct? Yes, and a different scene. You can't have more than one point of view per scene. Well, you know, right. I can't say you can't because you can do anything <laughs> you want, but it's safer. Okay, okay. We'll say it's safer if you if you have one point yes. of view character per scene. Yes, yes. that makes sense. That makes sense. Wow, that and I, I think a lot of that for a new writer would be a little bit overwhelming. Um, what would you suggest they do as far as trying to master that point of view? Would it be more trial and error, or how would you recommend they go about that? They really have to just. Um, they really have to write, 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 write. It, it, it's really. Trial and error, like you said, I mean, you know, and, and it's important. Okay, here's my advice. Get a critique partner because your critique partner and preferably your critique partner should be a little further along in their writing journey than you are. They'll say, well, how the hell can she see that? She's not outside. She's in the house. And stuff like that. And then, you know, the more critiques you get of those little tiny details, the more you absorb it. Right. What what did you think when, when you were kind of going back to that beginning stage? What did you find to be the hardest thing to master? Well, back then, I... You know, I didn't think writing was hard at all. I didn't know what the problem was <laughs> because, it seems, you know, it seems the less you know, the less hard you think writing is. Well, right. I guess that's true. <laughs> right? So back yes. then, you're just riding the dream, man. You know, right. you're, you're writing by candlelight. <laughs> you're, you're, you're dreaming that you're going to have your – name and lights I mean you know so it's really the more you know the more you say oh crap (laughs) (laughs) and the harder it gets absolutely absolutely comforting is (laughs) (laughs) no 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 it's it's definitely a a process well let's take a quick break and we'll come back (laughs) and we're going to talk more about crime writing with Sue Coletta This is Britt, Toastmaster, health and wellness coach, and crystal consultant with Isogenics. Are you ready to live your best life ever? Then join me for Get Fit, Feel Fabulous every Saturday at 10 a.m. Eastern on the Right Stream Radio Network. Each week, I invite an expert guest to share their wisdom on a variety of topics from holistic health, nutrition, weight loss, to becoming a successful entrepreneur and overcoming personal challenges. During every live broadcast, we welcome your calls and your participation in the chat room. Tune in to Get Fit, Feet Fabulous with Brit every Saturday at 10 a.m. Eastern on the Right Stream Radio Network. Welcome back, and we're talking crime writing with award-winning author Sue Coletta, and I have to tell you, Sue, this has just really been so far a fascinating show, even for me. Um, it just you're you're just such a wealth of knowledge, and oh. you know, and you really are. It's just amazing. And um, have you? I I know you have some books out as far as like research and such like that. Um, crime writers research, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell our listeners a little bit? because I know we've kind of covered structure and character. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about what you do to prepare either for a book or I don't know if it comes to a certain scene where you realize 
you need to kind of do something. Could could you kind of go into that a little bit? Sure. <clears throat> and that that's exactly what I do do is when I start out, I, I'm, you know, I plan my novels using an Excel spreadsheet with the milestones I mentioned. So I know really um, what what's coming next. So I try to write my scenes so that I'm setting them up, paying them off each scene. And so while I'm writing, usually I'll come across something that I have to um, research, which I love, and you know that. But um, yes. that's that, that's when I'll jump off my writing and dig into whatever it is, say a forensic technique or whatever. And, you know, it usually blows my writing day because then I'm I'm sucked into <laughs> to the research part, right. <laughs> making phone calls, <laughs> jumping in barrels, you know, but it's usually, um, you, you, I've also been known to put, you know, just a little note in the margin, research this and move on if I, you know, if it's something big that I need to know, like one character teaching another about something, for example, then I, I might put a note that that says get back to this if I'm on a roll. But otherwise, yeah, I stop and and research. Right, and sometimes your research takes on even more of like a three dimensional type of research. I mean, you actually put yourself in situations your characters might be in, almost like an actor or an actress preparing for a role. Correct? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I love doing that. I absolutely oh, love doing it that. Really, yeah, it really sounds fun. Can you maybe give us a little example of, of something you've done in the past where you've really been kind of hands-on? Sure. Um, I don't know if we mentioned this on the last show or not, but for Cleaved, which is my um, next thriller that releases, hopefully the end of this month, fingers crossed, um, yes. it, it opens with my character entrapped in an oil drum that's floating in a marsh. And I realized I had no first-hand knowledge of being confined to that extent because, you know, I, I've lived a pretty safe life. So <laughs> I said to my husband, would we happen to have any oil drums out there? Because when we first bought the house, we, there were five oil drums filled with with wood stove ashes. Don't ask me why, but whatever. So we had them at one point. And he said, as a matter of fact, I did save the 30-gallon oil drum. My character was in a 55, but I figured if I jump in the 30, then I'll, you know, just picture it a little more roomier. Well, wow, that, I couldn't believe what I felt inside that oil drum. First of all, you can't just step into a 30-gallon oil drum because it, they're way too narrow. So you have to kind of hang on to the side, hike your knees to your chest, and then lower yourself into it. Oh, yeah. So that was a wow. challenge, just getting in. And then I realized very quickly, oh, my God, I can't breathe because your knees are pressed up against your lungs to such an extent that it's, the pressure is enormous. And then the feeling of being trapped, even though I knew my husband was right on the other side, it didn't matter. I, I could not regulate my breathing no matter what I did. So that uh, became very important for the scene. And had I not jumped in the barrel, I would have never known that. Wow. So that, you know, that type of thing. Yeah, I wrote Absolutely. a much, much better yeah. scene. But, but yeah, and, I think and it's important. Absolutely. And did you have any repercussions after doing that? Like, you know, bad dreams or... You know, 
any 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 impact after doing that? I, you know, I didn't think I did, but apparently um, during final edits of Cleaved, uh, my husband told me I was screaming in my sleep two nights in a row. So whether I was living the story, because sometimes I do that in my dreams, I'm like, I kind of like soar around the story world, kicks me out. So. Um, oh, yeah, I bet. I bet. So, I mean, really, your your husband is having to go through, you know, some of these things with you. And, you know, luckily he's he is the way that he is. He's very patient and supportive of you. Um, <laughs> but that, because <laughs> that might freak some guys out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my publisher always says, "Oh, poor Bob." You know, I really do want to cry. <laughs> what I wanted to ask you, uh, in case there's true crime writers out there, is how do you go? How do you go about? Uh, first of all, the research end of it, and, and how do you make sure you're telling the real story? Right. That that is absolutely a challenge. Um, with the Zodiac, I actually made it a pretty simple outline of what I came to discover. I didn't really go into what the previous or other facts of the case were. Um, with the book I'm working on now, um, I'm actually making it historical fiction. So that way I'm not making kind of the opposite of what Capote did. I'm not making any claims of accuracy in the book, even though everything will be accurate. But I don't really make any claims that it will be, you know, in case there's a date that's off or or whatever. And plus I want to have some play with my characters. And that way I can enhance or add or change what I want. So um, with with the books that I'm writing at this point, I don't really have to do any research because it's all in my head. <laughs> right, because you so, worked the yeah. ankle blood case. Right, exactly. So it's pretty much all up there. But I like to give myself leeway as far as, you know, um, you know, if I want a character to be a little different. Plus, I don't want to use a lot of the real names because a lot of the family members were falsely accused. And I don't want to kind of bring that aspect back up. So most of my names, other than the main characters, are changed. So uh, that way, you know, people, I don't want them to get grief over it. <laughs> oh, I, I, but, I never even considered that. That, that has to yeah. be a real concern. Quick brag here. Uh, your book, yes. Zodiac, uh might be, I guess. So the offer is there to have it optioned for film, which is very exciting. Very exciting, yes. yes very. Very Ooh. exciting. <laughs> which and your work, so interesting. And your work in the In Cold Blood murders could turn into a TV series, correct? Yes, that is possibly going to happen um something is kind of going on behind the scenes but that's really all i can say about it um but of course i do want to apologize to anyone that's asked me for an interview recently or media or um blogs and things like that because at this point i'm not free to do kind of my normal routine i guess you could say so gotcha yeah because so that's great contractual agreement, correct? Yes, exactly. So um, once I get more solid information, then I can make more of a formal announcement. But for now, it's kind of yeah, behind the scenes, I guess you could say. But yes, kind of exciting. Very exciting. I know, because I'm behind the scenes. I know, uh, right? <laughs> you're, you're in the know. <laughs> I'm in the know. <laughs> yes, yes. So I love when, it. I guess that would be a very important um, 
aspect of true crime writing is the respect to the to the deceased as well as the family members. If you were going to use their yes. names, well, how, how do you, is there some way to you know, there's some kind of way to make sure that you 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 put them in the best light. Yeah, I think it's really tough because you want to report almost like a journalist. I think you want to report accurately about what transpired or took place. But my personal rule of thumb for me, and maybe I kind of go overboard with it, but, you know, my purpose of writing is definitely not to offend people or to hurt someone. So if I think there's any possibility that an innocent person would be affected by it, I either leave them out or completely change their identity, maybe even sometimes their gender, um, but like, for example, with Zodiac, the person that I, um, you know, allege perpetrated the crime is already a convicted serial killer. So I didn't really feel too concerned about hurting his feelings. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, <deserve> <laughs> right, <laughs> right, exactly. So, uh, but yeah, I think it is a really fine line because you're really impacting people's lives. And I think that that's, got to be taken the the accurate reporting has to be measured by any innocent people that may be affected by it so it, it definitely is a struggle whereas with fiction it it's really nice because you don't really have that that concern or worry of the worst thing you're going to do is offend someone who doesn't like violence for example or gore um, right. someone might be generically offended by your book but if they are, they shouldn't be reading crime. <laughs> so, that's my philosophy. You know, and, and I yeah, that's kind of how. Yeah, you know, a lot of writers play it safe, but I always say, um, "Well, my killer did it. I didn't do it." <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. I, I right. kind of hide behind. <laughs> He's the jerk, not me. Why right. are you me? <laughs> but re- but when yes. you're dealing with real victims, that that's a heavy burden. I really is. That is a very, yeah, that is a very heavy burden and that, you know, it, it's something that really has to be taken at, at least, you know, it has to be really thought out. You're not always going to get it right. Um, I'm sure journalists struggle with the same anxieties and fears and concerns because when you're reporting the news, um, you know, that that has consequences to it um, in on many levels. So, I think as long as it's done with a heavy heart and a real um, kind of soul searching about what should or should not be included or what, you know, where you want to go, because there are so many positive values to the storytelling and lessons and um, things that can be learned that I think oftentimes that's going to outweigh a slight that someone might feel. Um, but, yeah, it definitely is um, something that, you know, all of us writers struggle with is, especially when it comes to, you know, let's say a, a, an intimate scene and then one of your relatives reads the book, that can be kind of awkward. <laughs> oh, so yeah. those kind of things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So those things are, <laughs> you and know. Don't you find, um, well, you must deal with this even uh, even more because, in Zodiac, you include a lot of your own personal experiences. Did you have any apprehension? Yes. You did. I did. I did. I really kind of thought, oh, should I? But I just kind of went with my gut because at that point, the material was so heavy and it was my first book. And I wanted to kind of bring the lightness to it of, and you know how they say, write what you know, and of course I knew my life, so it was kind of the easiest way for me to lighten that heavy nature of that case because it is so grueling, the the subject matter. So that was kind of my way of helping the reader digest and absorb the just the horror of, of the things that he did. Um, so, yeah, but it was a little, um, you know, a little awkward, kind of like inviting someone into your living room, I guess, that you don't know. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I, I think that aspect added a great deal to the book. I 
we didn't know each other that well when I first You're read right. Zodiac, and I felt so much closer to you after I I read the book because, like you said, it, it was like I was, you know, peeking through your windows and seeing your life, and I I think that it was admirable. Oh, thank you. Very. And you know, it's funny because I I felt the same way with Mard. Um, and you know, I think the reason being is even though that's not about you at all, you know how just little things kind of tend to peek out of your books that they're just they're, there's a little bit of you in there. And oh yeah. I I think yeah. So I felt like I really got to know you a lot better from reading your work. And um, yeah, it's fascinating. It really is. It's yeah. I th- think that's the magic of 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 writing is that. You know, writers bear their souls when they write. And Absolutely. It really, don't you find that a reader-writer relationship can be very intimate, whether the reader knows it or not? I agree. Yeah, absolutely. It really is. It, it's a an interesting almost exchange, if you will. And, yeah, I do. I find that very, very fascinating. It really is. Now, um, really quick, because i got to make an announcement before we go because we, well, I'll just say it now. Um, we're going to be ending a little early today due to a little technical glitch, so we'll be off at 2.30, but we will be back um, in a month. And um, really quick, Sue, could you just tell our readers about when Cleaves is going to be released and where they can find it and that kind of good stuff? Sure. Um, Cleaved should be up for pre-order uh, at the end of this month. If you go to my website at www.sucoletta, it's one L, two T's, dot com, I'll have a huge announcement so you'll be able to find out there. The official release is May 3rd. So it, it usually Excellent. goes up for pre-release a few weeks before, yeah, like six weeks before. Excellent. Well, we have, you know, so much more to talk about next time because I, I, I just, this has been fascinating for me, you know, to listen to, you know, just your, your expertise. And I mean, have you thought about really quick writing a book on structure? No, there's far better teachers out there than, than me. I leave it no. to them. <laughs> I got enough work to do. <laughs> I know you do. Right? I know that is. You, look at me always trying to give you new work. <laughs> right. <laughs> I love it. Well, I have Let had a blast. One, and one quick question. Did, yeah, did you ahead. ask? Did you ask your family per, for permission before you um, opened your life up in Zodiac? I did. I. I asked okay. my immediate family, but I did not ask my siblings. <laughs> so I don't know really how they felt about it. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, but I, but I asked my children and, and my husband, but I didn't ask my siblings. So hopefully no one was too annoyed about it. <laughs> and that's, that, that's a really good idea for anyone who wants to include their personal life in true crime. Tell your family Absolutely. first. You're not that, shocking them. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Well, we will reconvene next time, and thank you all so much for listening to Right Stream Radio. Take care. Bye-bye. Partners. In crime, we're partners in crime. In crime, partners in crime. We're partners in crime. In crime. On a ride.